Good uh, day. My name is uh, Don Lobman. Uh, I am uh, soon to be 91 years of age, uh, having spent uh, most of my life in various parts of the Western world. I uh, was born in Provost, Alberta in 1921. Uh, I joined the RCAF in uh, uh, 1939 as the day I signed up, but uh, we were, I wasn't called up until September of 1940 because we hadn't got uh, the training facilities in force yet. But why Air Force? Why did I do that? Uh, when I was uh, about six years old, we were living in Westlock, Alberta, and uh, one day, uh, Wap May, uh, who was a very famous bush pilot, uh, Canadian bush pilot, came to town uh, on a demonstration thing. He would take people for rides, etc. I went out and watched this, and I became fascinated. Uh, later on, when we moved to Edmonton, I used to go out to the airport frequently and hang over the fence watching aircraft taking off and landing. I had become hooked on airplanes at that point. And so I, I joined the Air Force. I, as a matter of fact, I was working in a grocery store in uh, downtown Edmonton just after graduating. And I noticed these people in blue uniforms going in and out of the building across the street. So I checked it out and discovered that it was the Air Force recruiting office. So when I became 18 in October of 1939, I went over to see what uh, I could do. Uh, as I s mentioned, I uh, started serving in uh, September of 1940, at which point they were able to train people. I did uh, most of my training in, uh, in Alberta, in Lethbridge for elementary, Calgary for service, uh, and then went to Trenton for the instructor's course, and came back and I instructed at an RAF uh, elementary school at uh, DeWinton, Alberta, just south of Calgary, and uh, did so for about a year and a half. But I was anxious to get overseas. We heard one day that uh, there was a hurricane squadron forming at Lethbridge. So a buddy of mine uh, and I, he was also an instructor, flew down, introduced ourselves to the uh, squadron leader, RAF squadron leader, who's commanding this uh, squadron, and uh, suggested to him that maybe he could use a couple of uh, pilots who had a few flying hours behind them. And uh, we then went home. And sure enough, not very much longer after that, he uh, had arranged, we got posted down to his uh, unit. Now, and they were flying hur hurricanes, which uh, was a good step forward. I, um, w well the squadron eventually moved out to Boundary Bay and uh, uh, just south of uh, Vancouver. And uh, shortly after arriving there, we got word that we could now start sending people overseas. And there was going to be one pilot every three weeks. And we were to draw lots, straw straws, to see what order we would go in. I drew number 26, which is a long, long way off. I went to number 25 and said, you know, three weeks isn't going to make much difference to you, is it? Uh, why don't we trade? And I worked my way up to number two. <laughs> but I couldn't dislodge number one, who happened to be the, my buddy, the fellow who had gone down to Lethbridge with me. Anyway, we, uh, time came and away I went overseas. Uh, went to Bournemouth and um, there, uh, from there received a posting to, uh, golly, I forget the name of the squadron and the base at the moment, uh, but it wasn't to my liking. They were flying a, a, a twin-engine aircraft, which uh, was not a very good one, and uh, was no lo didn't stay in service very long. Anyway, my uh, buddy was posted to a Spitfire squadron in 126 wing. Uh, I, <laughs> I got in touch with him and said, you know, can't you arrange something for me? 
And he did, and I was then posted to 126, to 410, 412 Squadron, uh, which uh, I stayed with uh, until I finished my first tour. Uh, very interesting time uh, prior to the uh, invasion and uh, subsequent uh, during the invasion and uh, follow up uh, across uh, uh, Europe, across France and uh, Belgium uh, into Holland and finally into Germany itself. The, uh, how did I become interested in, in flying in airplanes? I uh, mentioned the, the, the groundwork. I became very interested, started building models, and uh, uh, even designed a few myself, which convinced me I should not be an aircraft designer. They were not very good ones. But uh, when I uh, was finally uh, chosen and uh, opted to go into training, I went to ITS, Initial Training School in Regina, which was uh, just to acquaint you with uh, some of the procedural aspects and do some uh, flying, uh, if you can call it that, on the link trainer, and also some decompression stuff to see if you had any particular problems in either of those areas. I then was posted to elementary at Lethbridge. Uh, and enjoyed that very, very much. Came uh, very, very close to getting fired. Because uh, one day I was out flying solo and uh, I saw another uh, tiger moth and I went and attacked it and it turned out to be the chief flying instructor. <laughs> but he was a very <laughs> kind man. He, he let me continue. Uh, after uh, graduating from elementary, I was uh, then posted to service flying at 3S FTS in Calgary. But this was a bit of a shock because they were flying Avro Anson's twin engine, which normally meant that you're going to go bomber on the bombers. Although I enjoyed flying the, the Anson very, very much, it was not really what I wanted to do. So after graduating there, uh, I went, as I mentioned, to instructor school and that got me back on the single engine path which was good. Let's see, the Tiger Moth of course, uh, we had uh, a, for a brief period uh, when we're, uh, I was at the uh, instructing at the elementary school, uh, we were of course flying Tiger Moths which is a, bi a biplane, a, a very nice airplane but uh, not very high performance. We uh, changed then to Stearman's, again a biplane, but much more powerful. Uh, it was really a wonderful airplane to fly, open cockpit, so that uh, during the winter uh, it was a little chilly. I can remember we at uh, the three, uh, 5S331 EFTS, I'm sorry, uh, we were uh, an international organization. We had student pilots from all over the world, or the Western world. Uh, we had some Polish students, quite a few of them. And I can remember one day a Polish wing commander came to visit the base to, you know, check out on his people. And he uh, went flying with our CFR, chief flying instructor, in one of the steermen. And I don't know if he'd ever been in a Stearman before in his life. It didn't matter much, apparently. They were flying uh, out to the forced landing field, I believe it was, at a fairly low level, around 1,000 feet or thereabouts. And uh, no, it was below that. It was two or 300 feet, really, now that I think of it. And uh, he was flying. And all of a sudden, without any preparation, notification, or anything, he, he, he pulled up and did a loop from straight and level flight. <laughs> the CFI, I'm afraid, was a little bit taken aback. Uh, you couldn't do that in a, in a Tiger Moth. You had to dive to get enough airspeed. 
And I had no idea that you could do it in a Stearman from level flight. But it was a very, very good airplane. I enjoyed that. And that, I think, probably the only two biplanes that I had flown. Oh, uh, uh, Finch, Fleet Finch and Fawn, yeah. After we, uh, after I arrived in, in England, uh, as I mentioned, went to Bournemouth, it was my first experience with uh, being in any part of Europe, really. Uh, had heard and read a lot about uh, the knife life in the United Kingdom. But it's uh, and now my first experience. I enjoyed it very, very much, uh, particularly going into London, this huge, beautiful city, and all the things that had to offer. Uh, pubs being one of the primary ones uh, f for us at that stage. Um, <coughs> the uh, <coughs> war was, uh, the Battle of Britain had concluded now, but there was still activity. The Germans were still coming over, were sending buzz bombs, or er er occasionally aircraft over and they were after London. And we uh, uh, were instructed and empowered to go and chase these guys. Never had any success because they were mainly at night and we were not night flying. But uh, it was a very interesting, very exciting period. But during the uh, first few months that we were there, when I joined the, the squadron 126 wing, we moved around a lot. We would go to this base for a little bit of uh, air to ground training, uh, go to that base for something else. And I guess uh, we must have been to half a dozen different bases before settling at Biggin Hill, subsequently Tangmir, and then uh, into the, uh, onto the continent. While uh, we were on the squadron, well, the, the whole period, I, I guess, uh, while, whilst on uh, the squadron, uh, we would, uh, a, day, a typical day, we would uh, get up, go to the mess, have uh, breakfast, go down to our dispersal area, and there you would sit and wait. Uh, either you would uh, be uh, called upon to do some training flying, flying training, uh, or some operational training. Uh, and in a, either case, it was controlled from your dispersal hut. Uh, if there was a wing uh, operation, we would all then go to the uh, central um, facility, the, uh, w the wing uh, headquarters, and uh, get briefed on the upcoming trip. It was very interesting, uh, you know, the various tasks and targets that we were assigned each and every one of them was, was different, although they were similar in some respects. But uh, our, the last month or two or three prior to the invasion, most of our effort was directed right to the continent. We were dropping bombs and uh, doing some uh, ground attack work. If we see a vehicle, we'd go and shoot at it or a train, that sort of thing. Uh, they, uh, while I was, when I was posted to a uh, squadron over in England, they were flying Spitfires. Uh, initially, the Mark V. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful airplane to fly. Beautiful. Uh, very sensitive to the controls. Very, very maneuverable. Uh, as the development progressed, so did the performance of the aircraft. Uh, when uh, Prior to the invasion, we were converted to the Mark 9B in, in our wing, which was a wonderful, wonderful airplane. I think, in many respects, the best of all the Spitfire family. Um, lots of speed, lots of maneuverability, lots of climbing ability. And uh, the only uh, thing that the German fighters could outdo us on was diving. They were a little faster going downhill than we were. But uh, finally, toward the end of the war, we converted again, this time to uh, Spit uh, 13. 
or 14, I'm sorry, uh, which was a magnificent airplane, different engine, Griffin, uh, five-bladed prop, uh, much faster. It was, it was a, really a magnificent airplane. Uh, 14 was far and away the best fighter aircraft in the war, bar none, including the j first jet, the Meteor, which the RAF had, and which I uh, flew, I guess it was, it was just after the war. That, yeah, it was just after the war that I flew the Meteor. The, uh, toward the end of the war, we've been moving across Europe fairly successfully. Everything was going very well. The General Montgomery was commanding the, uh, the army in our uh, part of the neck of the woods. Uh, and he uh, came up with a, a novel and very daring scheme. Uh, he was uh, planning an operation to move from Eindhoven, where we were based at the time, right up to uh, across the Rhine River up in the uh, uh, Ar Arnhem Nijmegen area. Uh, and we were to provide cover for this. The, uh, he was going to get on the highway with his troops and just go, and uh, we were to provide aerial cover for him, which we did. There were a lot of gliders uh, carrying people, and they, they sort of were strewn all over the place. Uh, but it was a, an immensely successful operation. Arnhem, unfortunately, the bridge at Arnhem was captured, but they had to give it up because there was a German brigade training in the area, and they were not able to uh, uh, hold off those people. On the other hand, uh, Nijmegen uh, was retained, and that became our axis to Germany, the route which we followed. Uh, the Germans uh, were quite concerned about the loss of that uh, bridge, and they put up quite an effort to uh, uh, either destroy it, make it impassable, or to get it back. And uh, they uh, put a great deal of air effort into this, uh, and uh, some of us were fortunate enough to be involved in this uh, to a very large extent. Uh, it uh, was retained, uh, although they, they did all sorts of things. They sent people floating down the river to, to place bombs, uh, none of which succeeded, fortunately. Flying, of course, uh, during the war, you're always concerned about <laughs> those people who are shooting at you, and that's going on constantly. Anti-aircraft fire, you could, all the time you can see the little black balls of smoke appearing around you. Uh, I was hit uh, by uh, one of them. Uh, one time I was leading a section of four. Uh, we had bombs on board, uh, and I forget the target that we were after. It hit my starboard aileron, and the aileron sort of one end of it came loose, and it was sort of dangling. Uh, now I've got this bomb on, and I, you know, with the way we release the bomb, we dive and gain a, a great deal of speed, release it and pull out. I didn't want to do that uh, with this damaged wing. So I told the other three guys to go and drop their bombs in the normal way, which they did. And I flew level <laughs> at, I don't know how many thousand feet, maybe 10, and I released it uh, from level flight got back safely, no problem. Uh, I'd, I had a, a couple of other occasions when I was hit by flak, but nothing major. The first aircraft, I think it was the first aircraft I destroyed, uh, was a Ju-88, uh, a light bomber. Uh, I got, was hit by the rear gunner uh, from that aircraft. He was firing back at me as I was shooting at them. Uh, again, not any major damage, just uh, some holes in my airplane, which they plugged, I guess. And navigation was uh, a bit of a problem. Uh, you got familiar with the area pretty quickly. 
uh, and there were a few landmarks that you could use to orient yourself. Uh, we had maps, uh, always, uh, and you would use the map to, to get on the right heading to go wherever you were headed. But there, once you got in the uh, enemy territory, you, you sort of uh, flew by the seat of your pants. You uh, were looking at for various targets, uh, and you would turn over here to look at that one a little more closely, and so on and so forth. You didn't have any set pattern at all. Uh, but there is always an exception, and that is when the weather is not very good. Uh, we didn't have the facilities that are available now and were coming into being at that point, like radar. We did have some radar. Uh, we did have uh, uh, homing devices. The uh, signal would be transmitted from the base and you could pick that up and home in on it. Uh, and I guess some of the scariest uh, uh, adventures I would have had, and I'm sure others the same, was bad weather. You're coming home. The weather was either bad uh, or becoming bad, and lots of really dangerous, dangerous incidents occurred. But, uh, you know, with a lot of luck, you survived. I think the worst thing about this war and the, the being a fighter pilot was the loss of your buddies, you know, uh, and we, it was constant. You were losing people all the time. Not uh, as a fighter pilot, not nearly as bad as the bomber commanders, uh, command uh, people were uh, suffering. Terrible losses, you know, 25 bombers a night and that, uh, when they do a thousand bomber raid. But we had our share nonetheless, and uh, that was always uh, sad to say goodbye to those guys. Effort, it was a target of opportunity deal where you, we would go out into a certain area and anything that we could uh, see or spot, uh, we were free to go and attack. Uh, I spotted uh, some dust coming up from a road in, in uh, Germany. This is on the north side of the, uh, uh, the uh, Rhine River near Bremen. And uh, as I looked at this a little more closely, I could see there were two vehicles running down a, a road. I went after them. And that was uh, <laughs> not a very good move for a squadron commander, you know. I just went after them, period. Anyway, uh, it turned out there were gas bowsers, gas trucks, tankers. Uh, I shot at the first one, the rear one. I uh, got strikes on it, um, pulled through and started shooting at the leading vehicle. Again, got strikes on it. Now I'm getting pretty darn close. I'm right down on the deck. I'm passing over the top of these vehicles at no more than 20 feet up in the air. They exploded in a massive ball of fire, and I'm right in the middle of it. Came out the other side of this fireball, and I, my beautiful Spitfire is now jet black. Everything. The windscreen, I couldn't see out of it. I had to open the windscreen and wipe off a little bit so that I could see. But I was concerned because there was a pretty powerful blast and the uh, radiator on the spit was underslung. It was hanging underneath the, the belly of the aircraft. And I was just a little bit leery that maybe that blast had done something to the radiator. So I started gingerly climbing and heading home. Uh, I got up to about 7,000 feet and I noticed the temperature gauge starting to rise, which means that I am losing glycol, the coolant. Uh, the line of demarcation was the Rhine River. If I can get across the Rhine, I'm okay. Uh, the uh, it's there, I can see it, I'm getting closer. But now my engine's starting to fuss. Uh, and pretty soon it quit. And it started to burn, it was on fire. So I've, I've got to get out of this thing now. 
I uh, got down to about 800 feet before I decided that it was time to get out. And I'm virtually stalled and trying to stretch the glide. I did, I got out and uh, I'm in my parachute and uh, I hear shots. And I thought, this is a terrible way to go. They're shooting at me in this defenseless position that I'm in. And then I realized it was my own ammunition from the aircraft was sitting right below me on fire and I'm gonna land in it. Or <laughs> I came very close, just a few feet from the aircraft. There was a little copse of uh, trees beside it. But as I was getting out, I ankles caught the tailplane of the airplane. I thought I'd broken uh, one leg. Uh, so I crawled into this uh, little bit of a bush and crept around a bit and, and found the only thing I could hide under was a fallen tree, which happened to be about three inches in diameter. So I stuck out on both sides of it. And it was not long before there was a, a crowd gathered and uh, some Hitler youth were searching this bush for me and, and they found me. I was uh, then taken into custody by a, a German uh, army captain, I believe, and uh, asked, forced to walk to his headquarters, which was about a half mile away on what I thought was a broken leg. As it turned out, it was uh, nearly a sprain. So this now is the 16th of April, only two weeks after I've arrived back. And uh, the war, of course, in Northwest Europe ended on the 8th of May. I eventually, after a couple of days and stops at a couple of other places, uh, was taken, the, the, uh, Sta the Luft, Stalig Lufts, the Air Force uh, bases for prisoners uh, had moved up to the Lubeck area because of the oncoming invasion. So there's no place really to put me. The, uh, I was put into a, a, a bus. I'm the sole pr pastor in this bus, two drivers. And they drove me up to a place called Pinneberg, up, uh, the, not far from Hamburg uh, on the Rhine River. It turned out it's a German uh, early uh, training base uh, for recruits, very large base. There were about 6,000 uh, troops there. I don't know whether they were there at the time I arrived, but that was the capacity of the base. Uh, I was not feeling very well. Uh, discovered that I had jaundice and I am put in the hospital on the base. And that was fine. They were, they were very kind. They did all they could for me, which was not very much because they were uh, a little uh, short of things. They, uh, a few days later, maybe a week or so, um, no, it'd be early May now, uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, an armored vehicle, a British armored vehicle, drove into the camp. Uh, so we were all very, very excited about this and went over and gathered around and the general who was commanding the base appeared and uh, we chatted for a little while and then the fellow in charge of this uh, armored vehicle said, oh, sorry chaps, we, we have to leave, we gotta go. I said, well, you can't. You, yeah, we've gotta go back. So I am now what is called the SBO, the senior British officer on the base. So I'm in command. The general has surrendered to me. <laughs> I issued two commands. Uh, turn your weapons into the guardhouse and you're all confined to your, camp, your uh, quarters. I went back to the hospital. A short time later, uh, the uh, orderly came to me and said, you're wanted on the phone. And I said, who in the world knows where I am? So I went to the phone and it turned out it's the general's aide seeking my permission for the general to go to the mess to have his lunch, which was granted. <laughs> and 
they, in uh, the meantime, there's another fellow from my squadron has arrived in, in this place. And uh, we decided that it's time to go home. So he went out and borrowed a German vehicle that he found somewhere. And we two of us got into it and drove back to uh, our base. During the war itself, I, uh, well, until I became a guest of theirs at the, at the end of the war, uh, had really no contact with, with the Germans, uh, the German economy or countryside. Um, we uh, were imbued with the fact that the Germans were our enemies. They were Hitlerites, and therefore they were bad, and we had to do something about it. I accepted that, uh, as did all of the people uh, on the, the wing, the people I was associated with. After the war, I was posted to Germany several times, uh, lived uh, much closer to them, uh, and found them to be very, very nice people. I en enjoyed them. I can remember I was base commander at a place called Zweibrücken in Germany, and uh, it was an elevated <coughs> site surrounded by um, villages, really, and one of which uh, had a barbershop uh, chorus, and I enjoy that music. I used to go down there and listen to them practice. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, subsequently, th they came up to the mass. They were invited. I guess the word got out that I had become acquainted with these people. Uh, they were invited to come up to the mass to provide entertainment, which I found to be very nice. Later on, when I, I, w I went back on another tour, this time to Lahr in Germany, and they were invited down there uh, several times. We had a very good relationship. As I mentioned, uh, we met and became friends with a number of German former fighter pilots, Gunter Rahl being one of them, who was a wonderful guy. Uh, he was subsequently the uh, chief of staff of the Luftwaffe. Uh, and he and his wife, his wife had been a, either a doctor or a nurse, and Gunter was shot down and injured during the war she nursed him back to health, and that's how they met and became uh, husband and wife. They had a, a home, a house, a cottage, really, a big cottage, on the north side of uh, Lake Constance, uh, which is between Germany and uh, Switzerland. And they invited us to spend a weekend with them at uh, their cottage down there. And it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. They were fine, fine people, and uh, we got along very, very well. War, uh, I have always felt, is a very stupid way to settle a difference of opinion. Uh, the cost in terms of lives, money, etc., is absolutely incredible. However, uh, this, as far as I was concerned as a kid, uh, going in and flying Spitfire aircraft, it was a great adventure, exciting uh, opportunity, tremendous. Um, I often thought about the, the guy you're shooting at, you know, I didn't particularly like the thought of uh, killing another individual, so I rationalized that uh, I wasn't shooting at him, I was shooting at that thing that he was sitting in. I was going to destroy that airplane or the tank or whatever it is. And that, uh, I could live with that. Uh, but I, uh, I uh, having been in the uh, prisoner war camp, came back on a ship right after the war uh, full of POWs. Uh, we were met at uh, Montreal, actually. Uh, by uh, a number of our former associates, including our wing commander, and a very, very nice fellow, uh, Dal Russell. And uh, we're chatting away and say, why don't we get together and, and 
have spend some time together and it was decided that Banff would be a good place to do this. So at the appointed day and hour, we, I arrived at Banff and Dal Russell was there, but he's the only other one who showed up. Uh, so the two of us, we're walking down in, in our uniforms, walking down the main street in, in Banff and coming the other direction is a, a gaggle about six young ladies, two of whom I knew one that I had gone to school with, and one who was the sister of a former Air Force uh, associate who'd uh, been badly injured. So we, we chatted and had fun, and uh, one of the members of that group was a young lady whom I subsequently married. Uh, fascinated with her right off the bat, and, and it was great. We had a wonderful uh, my marriage, uh, life together, and. Unfortunately, she passed away after 54 years, and it's been a little lonely without her for the last 12 years. When uh, the, uh, we got into the Canadian Tire, as I mentioned, and I finally we arrived in Red Deer. I opened the first store here in uh, <laughs> when 1979. Yeah, 79 and uh, got very involved in the community. Uh, the first thing I was on was the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Then uh, I got a letter from uh, one of the local lawyers and said I'd been nominated to be a member of the board of the uh, district foundation, no, the Radio. community foundation, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was just forming. I had no knowledge of this or anything about it. So that was my first endeavor. Uh, shortly after that, I uh, was listening to the radio and they were talking about a thing called Crime Stoppers in Edmonton, which was just forming. Uh, sounded like a great idea to me. So I went to the local uh, uh, RCMP commander and said, I would like to check this out. Uh, can I have someone go up to Edmonton with me? Uh, he gave me a, a one of the officers, and away we went. We're very, very impressed with uh, the scheme, the plan. So we came back, and uh, we formed a, a Central Alberta uh, Crime Stoppers, uh, which I was involved with for six or seven years. Uh, then subsequently got involved with the uh, Hospital Foundation, was on the board for... I guess six years, chaired uh, the board for a couple of years, um, became involved with the uh, lending cupboard. Again, I was on the board uh, as vice chair, uh, and I worked in the uh, office for a number of years. Um, was involved with the hospice society uh, in a fundraising capacity and numerous committees of one sort or another, uh, all of which I really enjoyed and I, I felt obligated. Uh, I had had a lot of, a fair bit of success. Uh, people and communities in the country had been very kind to me. It was time I could give something back. Uh, and I really enjoyed doing it.